Hi everyone. Welcome to the Startup Operator podcast. I'm uh, Roshan Karyappa and today I'll be speaking to Rahul Mathur who is a, a startup lead at the Accenture FinTech Innovation Lab in the UK. Uh, he's had stints at Ernst & Young, Willis Towers, Watson and Laka before uh, and covers the insurtech ecosystem very well. Uh, and we'll try to understand how that is developing over the course of this uh, conversation. Uh, so without further ado, welcome Rahul. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey Roshan, thank you very much for having me on the show. I am super excited like you we were saying just before the uh, mic got rolling that the first podcast I've been on uh, this year as a guest. So I'm quite excited to see uh, how this goes. I've enjoyed a couple of the previous episodes as well. So all ready to get started. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I forget that you are a podcast host as well. So I mean, you should have some notes from me. <laughs> no, I, I think you're doing a fantastic job, right? We're all learning. I think it's still podcasting yeah. is very nascent, unlike mainstream media. So yeah, yeah. it's going to be a long journey and fun one. Yeah, definitely. So I'm looking forward to this uh, chat. And, uh, you know, let's begin with uh, what piqued your interest in insurance, right? It seems like an old person's industry, uh, the, the average age uh, of an insurance agent, I think, in the U.S. is about 50 years old. And uh, you are clearly the youngest person that I've had on the podcast uh, <laughs> thus far, <laughs> right? So, so what gives? Yes, yeah, so I think it's a super interesting question, right? So I'm 22 and you're right. You know, the average agent is uh, probably around my parents' age. But I think what really got me very fascinated about insurance was the fact that very early in my life, my mom contracted a disease called septicema and we had private health insurance with uh, one of the carriers and effectively I was mind blown at how you know my grandfather and my mother were paying about 50,000 rupees per annum in premiums wow. and effectively the, insur- yeah, effectively the insurance company ended up paying out what would have been in the range of 40 to 50 lakh for the treatment and I guess post-operative care at home. And it really blew my mind, right? So for for many years, I was always wondering, how does this work out? You know, it turned out I was reasonably good at mathematics in school. And my mom one fine day took me to meet an actuary at an insurance company. I said, wow, this is a very cool job. I actually, at the time, didn't think it was cool because of the fact you're working with mathematics. But just because I thought the guy's office was really cool. But, you know, one thing leads to another. After school, I went to Warwick to study to become an actuary. I worked at, say, my proper uh, a formal job in, I guess, in the insurance industry and realized it's probably not the best uh, career path for me. And that's what took me out to Accenture and I actually sit in a unit called the FinTech Innovation Lab, where InsurTech is definitely one of the verticals we look at. So that's like the you know, two minute summary on what got me interested into insurance and what's got me to where I am today. Yeah, very interesting. So this person I know, uh, Anil Nair, uh, who was uh, earlier with Majesco, and I think he works with a few startups now, uh, you know, he's one of those people who got me really interested in insurance as well, because uh, he said, look, insurance runs the world. I mean, which pretty much everyone uh, will say the same about their industry, right? Logistics runs the world or advertising runs the world or whatever. But what he said was insurance gives you leverage, right? Uh, Everything that we do is some form of risk taking, some form of, uh, uh, you know, some initiatives that we do, right? Uh, uh, And uh, insurance plays such a huge uh, role in that. Uh, But, you know, thinking about the insurance industry itself, I mean, they do have sort of a problem now uh, attracting millennials, right? I mean, there are efforts to sort of lure uh, the likes of you into the industry. So how's that been working out? Yes, I think the the recruitment is 100% a challenge I kind of see at uh, every sort of insurance company, right? There's an old kind of saying that, Uh, the people who couldn't get that investment banking job ended up becoming actuaries. And uh, what you kind of end up seeing is there isn't like a uh, recruitment or talent problem as you go senior up in the insurance companies because they tend to hire out of management consulting firms or investment banks for more senior roles. But you're right, there is a huge sort of talent crunch, not only in India, but also in the West at you know insurance broking companies and any other form of entry that services insurance business i haven't come across a dependable solution 
I mean, you've probably seen some really uh, glitzy kind of marketing or advertising campaigns, but maybe, you know, stuff that's going on in the insurtech ecosystem, like in India, I think Echo, Digit, and maybe now yeah. Navi Insurance are making it a bit cooler and more trendy. So you can finally be the actuary walking into the office in jeans and sneakers rather than wearing like a white shirt and uh, pants. So may, there's a good chance, you know, some of the, if we have a couple of breakout success stories like Echo is in the making, Digit is definitely there. Yeah. It might change uh, young talent's perception, but it's a long journey and they're definitely fighting against, you know, a big tech company or every other investment bank that is out there today. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think insurtechs are sort of the answer, right? So insurance is one of those domains that, you know, didn't change for about 200 years. And then in the last 10 or 15 years, it, it's kind of turned on its head. Uh, and it's happened primarily because of the advent of insurtechs, right? Uh, companies that are using tech as an enabler to solve problems within that uh, uh, domain. Uh, can you help us understand what's happening in the ecosystem right now? I mean, how are these insurtechs... Uh, uh, complementing or competing with the carriers and so on? Yeah, it, I think it's it's very fascinating to see what is going on, you know, both at like global, but also at, at an Indian level. I think mm-hmm. in India, what you're starting to see is there's one trend, you know, quite broadly, you can split it between B2B and uh, direct to consumer. I think on the B2B side, what you're starting to see is just like in every other kind of vertical where there are companies that are being built in India and they end up selling to the rest of the world. So you have the likes of, you know, Artivatic, Metamorphosis, Inspect Labs, and they sort of have these enterprise sales cycles of 18 to 24 months. But effectively, Mm -hmm. once, you know, they get into a carrier, these guys have a bit of a land and expand strategy where maybe one or two big clients will pretty much take them like to a Series B or Series C kind of run rate. On the you know, direct-to-consumer side, what we're starting to see is there's a sort of mark divide between companies like Echo, Digit, who end up going the carrier route. That's typically more expensive uh, to set up where you get your own license. You typically have to put about uh, 100 crore rupees, which is about $50 million as regulatory capital, and then kind of scale up from there. I think that's an approach quite a few players in the USA are also taking like Root Lemonade. In Germany, you have VFOX uh, through one, which is also going down the carrier route. But what's very fascinating is as we record this, we're in the middle of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, perhaps Mm -hmm. like the worst part of it. But what I've seen is in the past maybe five or six months, there's been a bit of an explosion in terms of the number of non-insurance carriers, right? So these are just sort of almost like startups that have a broking or what the insurance industry calls like a corporate agent license. But effectively, they're putting on a really good UX and UI for uh, any form of insurance customer. I mean, the list actually goes on, right? So within this year itself, we saw Onsurity. I've seen uh, vertically integrated plays like Loop Healthcare, even Health a couple of uh, you know, SME focused insurance startups like Plum HQ and uh, recently formed Nova Benefits. So it's almost like um, COVID-19 has been a bit of an accelerant for these startups because unlike the carriers, they're kind of operating purely digitally online sales led. And you know, just having spoken to them, I think they're seeing a lot of inbound interest. I think it's also partly driven by the fact that you may be familiar that motor insurance third party is compulsory in India, but yeah. now the effectively the government has sort of come out with a statement saying that if you're an that if you're an employer and you've got someone on your payroll formally, you have to make sure that they have some form of health insurance against COVID-19 when you open up your workplace. So it's it's sort of almost like how um, the um, the demonetization was a huge moment for digital payments. It's almost like COVID-19 is becoming this for health insurance in India, although it's coming at a huge cost to people's lives. So that's sort of what I'm currently seeing right now. And I'm happy to drill into any one of those elements in more detail. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, India is such a, 
is is like such an ocean of opportunities right from an insurance perspective i think we have possibly what 10 10 to 15 percent coverage i would say right uh and uh, if you look at the insure tech ecosystem itself uh, there are the likes of laka uh, for you know for whom you worked uh, that covers bicycles and are, are sort of like the new age neo carriers uh, then you have uh, startups solving for customer experience say through bots and so on yeah. um, and then you have distribution through digital platforms then you have uh, you know uh, startups that are doing uh, back end analytics underwriting etc right and some of this is complementary and some of this is uh, competitive i would say uh, so you know let's talk about some of the common problems that uh, they seem to be uh, solving so what what is it that you see uh, uh, insurtex most common uh, uh, problems that they're trying to solve i think it, it, it's a really good question right and i'd say you know especially in the startup world you know like there is a bit of a bias for product over service i think in insurance what you kind of end up seeing is there is a bias to innovate on the product side versus uh, innovate on the distribution side and i think the biggest sort of challenge in india today right like you right you alluded to is going that last mile and increasing insurance penetration as a percentage of people who have insurance versus you know insurance penetration as a percentage of gdp one of the most sort of actionable metrics which kind of highlights you know how big this um, i guess shortage of protection is in the indian economy comes from swiss re where they've put something called the protection gap at uh, 92.2 so what this effectively means is in an average indian household if the uh, primary breadwinning member were to uh, pass away due to some unfortunate event effectively a family would only be able to cover 7.8 dollars out of every 100 dollars of its future expense until it could get its next uh, primary breadwinner to a reasonable position and that just shows you know how much of a green space there is to improve on getting insurance to people so i think yeah. right now the focus is definitely on um, insurance penetration and and like you said you know you see all of the payments platforms whether it's phone pay whether it's paytm whether it's you know some of the o2o players like bharat pay all of them have started you know layering on insurance with their offerings and effectively what they've kind of realized is you know if you have any form of captive user base selling insurance to them is almost like a zero customer acquisition cost per it comes yeah. with growth of customer lifetime value so for the payments apps distribution or even for like a bharat pay kind of a platform insurance is becoming like the next feature that they're working to monetize just like yeah. they did so with uh, lending on the working capital side and then previously payments so definitely yeah. distribution is one of those areas where you know startups whether they are you know purely insurance focused or whether insurance is just a feature in their overall offering i'm seeing people really double down on insurance distribution i think on the product side you know this is where things become a little challenging mainly because if you want to design your own insurance product you have to have some form of licensed insurance company who is willing to accept the risk that you generate by selling the product and that's where i'd say most um, startups kind of hit a barrier and it's not only in india it's pretty much everywhere else in the world i have personally heard of startups that have taken 12 plus months to actually get a product that they would like to sell based on their customer discovery through the door with a couple of insurance companies so it's a pretty long sales cycle and yeah. i think this is sort of where you know something like a navi a digital and aco have quite an advantage because they own their own balance sheet and i guess they've raised sufficient amount of money where they can you know retain the risk on their balance sheet and really innovate on the product side and i know i'm going on for very long but a really nice example of yeah. you know product innovation comes out of aco through the current uh, regulatory sandbox wherein i'm sure you've made a couple of orders on zomato swiggy or some other platform right so typically you're kind of able to tip your delivery executive i think zomato also had a really nice kind of ui there on the tip recently where you could kind of see 
what is the value of your tip so maybe like a biscuit or a chai or some form of other object effectively now once taco kind of launches this pilot with zomato and ola your tip can actually go and directly contribute towards the health insurance premium top up for the driver or the delivery executive so it's really fascinating because in the past you you were only allowed to contribute for premium either if someone or if, if the person you were contributing for was your family member or your employee but they're now kind of opening this idea up of crowdfunding of insurance premium and in fact crowdfunding of almost what is like a micro insurance premium so it's very fascinating obviously it requires a very very different approach both in terms of pricing the product but then also kind of squeezing down the expense ratio because uh, of the low kind of ticket size so that's yeah. what i'm seeing right now you know focus on distribution but also a bit on the product side slowly opening up with the sandbox right yeah i mean those are fantastic points uh, uh really i mean plenty that i could pick up on uh and you know i mean you're absolutely right uh, distribution is sort of the low hanging fruit in this whole ecosystem right in this chain as such uh and we've seen innovation on the product side because as they say insurance is sold not bought uh right and uh, uh there's a lot of focus on agents for example right they usually incentivize to go and you know get to that last mile distribution uh and you know we start to wonder whether that's still relevant today when consumers are a lot more proactive when digital is a reality information access is you know uh, pretty much uh, Uh, access to everyone right uh, so are you seeing consumers being a little more proactive right now i mean is is that old tenant tenant of uh, you know insurance is sold not bought uh, still valid yeah i think it's it's honestly one of the hardest kind of questions that you can kind of be given right especially given you know the macro climate is changing with covid 19 so there are a couple of points there right the first is obviously because of the pandemic the typical you know uh, field sales or the, that agency force that they deploy is unable to generate any meaningful business i think policy bazaar the price aggregate uh, sorry comparison website sort of came out with the statistic recently that it's seen roughly a 40% uptick compared to normal in terms of their health and life insurance purchases online so just like how you know a lot of companies are banking on changing consumer behavior i think web aggregators like cover fox like policy bazaar renew by and about 15 to 20 others are also hoping that you know given the pandemic you know a consumers yeah. may realize that it is important for them to be insured but b maybe they'll realize because of forced uh, i guess forced behavior that they can do it themselves and maybe do not need the agent but yeah. you know that being said if we kind of take a step back from where we are today and maybe go about 6 months back into the past if you look at every sort of web aggregator that came after policy bazaar so whether that is cover fox or sequoia back turtle mint they both have kind of gone to an omni channel approach so cover fox has cover drive uh, turtle mint has their mint pro app and the idea is not only were they doing you know direct to consumer online via performance marketing but then they were also doing a bit of b2b to c via a uh, field agents in tier 2 and tier 3 cities and i've been told that was a significant kind of driver of growth i think on this note you know a lot of your audience members may have been familiar with the almost like the growth hack that bharat pay employed you know we are paying uh, field agents about 3000 rupees a month to go and sign up merchants physically mm-hmm. i think the same kind of also applies in insurance as well where you can hit a uh, pretty good i guess economics using like a field uh, field agency so i was uh, just going to reference the accent of consumer backing uh, survey which came out uh, some time back i think 2019 uh, where you know and i think about 40 or 50000 uh, consumers were polled and uh, regarding all sorts of financial services offerings and you know what came out very clearly was uh, people prefer integrated propositions and an omni channel experience right so i wouldn't say that field sales and agency are redundant i just feel that you know going forward I, i'm not really sure that you need a uh, you need an agent to sell you a life insurance product 
there might be a lot more complexity in the products involved that uh, will require human intervention right yeah um, yeah and uh, you know talking about the point you mentioned earlier right so why can't we crowdsource uh, 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 policies for example right so uh, because healthcare uh, is the biggest expense for uh, people right i mean um, i can't think of anything uh, more pressing more basic and more essential right uh, mm-hmm. in, in that in that sort of a ticket size so yeah i mean i think you're going to see a lot more product innovation in terms of uh, complexity of the products yeah Uh, absolutely right. i think there are quite a few interesting points you mentioned there that i, I would have to unpack right but to be honest with you i've never been sure why you know you couldn't pay for you know say someone else is kind of um, health insurance yeah, premium but you know yeah. quite often this is just a manifest of you know old uh, regulations that haven't been revisited but the good thing is you know regulations are finally being revisited across the board right whether it's uh sebi or uh, the rbi or the irda which is india's insurance regulator i think you're seeing sandboxes everywhere and you know any of these weird kind of artifacts from the past will hopefully be changed but you know on specifically on you know the the agency sales things right what we're kind of seeing in insurance right or at least in the insurtech ecosystem is a lot of focus on what i'd say is um retail lines of business so this is focused on the consumer but there is still like this whole uh, green field in terms of serving smes and msmes yeah, and i can i can get into a bit more detail there right but when yeah. you get into that sort of a market quite often it's a very heavy right skew which means that the value of um, that market size is typically concentrated in a few kind of big players and those are actually overserved by brokers but there's still like this long tail of smes that effectively have no insurance yeah i mean uh, you know i was on a, i was talking to someone on a previous podcast and uh, you know he was he was talking about farming loans for example right i mean and he said that you know typical farmer considering that you know we have very small holdings in india will require something of the order of 50 or 60000 rupees but the kind of loans that are available of the, are of the order of like 3 or 4 lakhs yeah. right uh essentially what he or she requires is a working capital loan yes. right now there are a bunch of things that uh, uh you know insurance can solve for in uh, in markets like those right uh, or even small businesses uh, as you mentioned smes and so on so you know i mean in this entire ecosystem where does the likes of uh, let's say an accenture or an ernst and young fit in all of this can you speak about some of the initiatives that you know uh, uh, the consult companies are uh, uh, are up to in this yes i think it's it's a re- it's a really good question right and you know what i would say is this is sort of my view on what we're doing you know not necessarily reflective of uh, i guess kind of accenture's view because i'm here kind of uh, representing myself but for example accenture ventures which is our corporate venture capital arm in partnership with microsoft has actually just lo- uh, i made a public announcement about a challenge where you know i guess startups are kind of win get access to free as your credits and a couple of other kind of uh, benefits and support things i think in the indian market we still as a company maybe haven't sort of doubled down as much on fintech in short tech as we have but i think it's also sort of a factor around uh sme and agri being i guess markets where accenture doesn't really have a lot of um i would say i i guess companies we kind of consult with because maybe like the banks and insurance companies that sit in our kind of client pool work a little bit with um the with this kind of segment but to be honest with you apart from that challenge recently there there isn't much that i could actually talk about but uh, I'm happy to jump into the segment because it's something that really fascinates me. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh that's right and uh, we've engaged uh, uh Accenture and a few others on on innovation competitions and so on, right? So, uh I'm talking about Vimo where I work for uh where I work at. Um and uh, you know, we also work with a lot of insurance companies and one of the things that you realize is the insurance tech stack is like severely dated, right? 
um, uh, systems are uh, legacy even before you implement them, uh, them and you know you have to kind of live with them for about 17 years after uh, so do you see that stack uh, changing at all with the uh, insurtech uh, you know coming up i mean if yes uh, uh, how are the startups dealing with this problem of the the, the whole stack problem yeah i think that, that that's a really good question right so on the one hand you know you have startups like metamorphosis which are improving the core systems by almost you know putting like a middleware on top of them to then open up apis and kind of engage in this digital era but you know that's obviously like i said earlier you know 18 to 24 month sales cycle so metamorphosis has been doing like slow work and you know it's it's a very competitive industry because you know like the incumbents like dxc technologies also kind of look at these kind of sales because of the value but i think you know couple of the challengers like an aqua or digit are pretty much built on the cloud i'm not sure which uh, yeah. cloud provider they go with but i think it's also because uh, you know the, the cloud comes with a lot of uh, great features around i guess privacy and you know you can use any of the auto ml uh, features that are available online but you know since we're kind of discussing india specifically right it's not only about the tech stack that you use within your company but it's sort of how you integrate with i guess the broader india stack so you know whether yeah. that's aadhaar upi that's ob- that's the more kind of obvious one but i think the three that are sort of coming up right now on the one hand is you know bharat bill pay service which is built on top of upi and i think it's very relevant right now as i sort of mentioned you know the typically an insurance premium was paid you know lump sum annual and that was it but slowly the regulator has been opening up possibilities for premium payments in installments so if you kind of think of your installment based insurance premium that kind of becomes like your netflix subscription or your utility bill uh, you mm-hmm. may not want to pay your insurance but that's like a different question altogether but that's kind of one of the areas we're looking at bharat bill pay service for uh, your uh, for your premium payments the other one that you may be familiar with is national health stack so health yeah. insurance still contributes like a significant portion of retail insurance premiums i guess the national health stack obviously brings in some nice stuff around you know electronic medical records but one of the least kind of appreciated aspects of the national health stack from an insurance company perspective is something called the policy markup language so as a bit of a side note right one of the biggest kind of challenges in insurance is comparability of insurance products because of the way certain clauses in the policy are worded effectively you know the policy markup language in the national health stack is kind of an approach to make uh, insurance policy documents machine readable and you know the moment you allow for machine readability you're bringing in certain elements of standardization and therefore comparability for customers brokers and anyone else and this also comes at a time when the regulator is sort of doubling down on standardizing i guess aspects of uh, insurance policy wordings so if you see you know regulation and technology i guess public infrastructure are kind of intersecting with each other and i just don't think that most incumbents are kind of prepared to plug in with this kind of infrastructure and then you know to top it all off there's a lot of discussion going on around uh, the account aggregator scheme and you know insurance is one of the areas that they're kind of uh, looking to touch base with as well right so i'd say outside of the ob- the obvious kind of problems of moving from on pre- on prem to the cloud i think in india there's another unique challenge where it is you know if you're on prem how are you going to i guess incorporate the almost public ut- the digital public utilities that are available because if you don't use them you know challengers like aqua digital and nafi are definitely going to use them so you mm-hmm. you almost hit this position where you're at a natural disadvantage although you're an incumbent yeah yeah that's fascinating actually and that those are you know that that's i think really going to uh, be one of those things that's going to make all the difference right going forward uh, definitely uh, in terms of uh, how flexible uh, uh, your solutions are going to be and it's it's going to be enabled by this kind of technology no doubt about it right so yeah 
I, I was going to say absolutely right. I mean, I, and you know, in in to be honest with you, in defense of the insurance companies, right? They've uh, you may have heard of the Digi Locker sort of initiative, which yeah. is like this document repository. I'd say that's probably one of the few areas where pretty much insurance incumbents have jumped on the opportunity. And I think the last time I checked, there were about 430 million policy documents stored in Digi Locker, which is an indication that, you know, in some cases, uh, the insurance industry can move fast. But I, I have my doubts as to how many carriers are, or even startups are kind of thinking a bit more longer term about how, you know, the national health stack and account aggregator framework can be incorporated into the way they operate. But it's going to be a fascinating one. And I think that is, you know, if, if we were kind of discussing globally, I would have really focused my discussion on, you know, trying to go on-prem to cloud kind of thing. But I think in India, like I said, you, know, you have to look beyond your private tech stack to the public infrastructure. And that's yeah. where I think the more exciting thing is going to happen over the next maybe three to five years. Yeah, absolutely. So there's this, uh, uh, there's this article I read uh, some time back by uh, Angela Strange, who's an investor at uh, Anderson uh, Horowitz, where she essentially argued that every company would be a fintech company. Yeah. Uh, and the premise of the article was that uh, uh, a bank or an insurance company or whatever will act as the core, uh, manage the regulation, manage the risks, uh, and uh, will leave the services aspect of it to sort of the... Uh, the startups who leverage right through APS and so on, uh, and I guess uh, something of that sort might, might happen. And with the stack that you mentioned, especially right, yeah. uh, uh, so things should be really interesting going uh, forward. Really, so uh, absolutely uh, right. And you know, very quickly there, right? So mm -hmm. Angela Strange says, you know, every company will become a fintech company. Actually, depending on you know how you define insurtech, whether it's standalone from fintech or whether it's part of insurtech, I think mm -hmm. by extension you can say every company will become an insurtech Correct. company. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Paytm already has an insurance brokerage license. Uh, Bharat Pay, the last time I checked, is hiring like a couple of folks in the insurance domain. You yeah. look at Flipkart and Amazon. Amazon, of course, did the Aco investment, but right. Amazon's uh, payment app, Amazon Pay, is actually going to launch insurance as well. So I think yeah. what Angela said there very succinctly kind of highlights what's kind of going on in India where just like how lending was earlier a product then became a feature, insurance is actually going from a product to becoming a feature in an overall kind of customer offering. And it, it, it's a very exciting kind of space. Yeah. And it makes sense for startups as well, right? See, if you look at the likes of Paytm and so on, now they spent a ton of money trying to acquire these customers uh, through digital and they've got that acquisition, right? Now, yeah. now is the hard part of like actually selling them value, selling them services and creating that that LTV that, yeah. you know, all of them put on their Excel sheets and PowerPoints, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, what better way to, to kind of inflate that number rather than through financial services products with high margin and... Uh, yeah. Uh, essential services as such. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of, uh, what are some things that startups should know before they embark on the long, hard, tedious journey of solving for the insurance industry? Yeah, I think it's a very fascinating question, right? So I, I don't think I'll focus too much on the B2B side because typically, you know, the B2B insurance founder profile tends to be someone who's been in the industry on the buyer side for maybe about 10 to 15 years and has, you know, really understood how the processes work. But I think on the B2B to C and direct to consumer side, right? So if anyone's listening, listening to this, right, even if you are not looking to become an insurance founder, but you've got any form of platform where you have a captive user base, I think the one thing you should be aware of with insurance is if you can use an off-the-shelf offering, uh, proceed with that because it's typically the fastest route to market. So what I mean is if an insurance company has a product which maybe has been in the market for two to three years and meets you know, 80% of your requirements, just go ahead with it because getting an insurance company to design a product for you and then you know arrive at a fair price can actually make a, a cycle about six to 12 months long. 
and then it also depends on you know how innovative that product is you know for example the drone marketplace tropogo launched india's first kind of drone insurance product which uh, with hdfc ergo i'll be honest with you i don't even want to think about how long it might have mm-hmm. taken them but my advice is just always remember that in insurance not only do you have the stakeholder as a customer but you also have the insurance company you are working with as a as a stakeholder in your business and what you kind of need to remember is depending on how important the insurance product is that your carrier partner is providing you you will face like a bit of a counterparty risk right so going you know a bit of a taking a bit of a global view on insurtech there are quite a few insurtech startups that ended up in a position where the product that they were selling kind of fell outside of the scope of the new uh, quote unquote five year plan for their insurance carrier and effectively the product got dropped and if the insurance product is the only thing you're selling it means you know business grinds to a halt so also be a bit cognizant about any kind of counterparty risk that you may face by you know making insurance an increasingly large part of your bottom line or your contribution margin or whatever metric you're kind of looking at because um, insurance companies are managers of risk and they kind of understand when they need to exit and when they need to stay put that's like the primary piece of advice i'd give to uh, prospective founders or operators or pms at you know any kind of a fintech company looking at insurance mm-hmm. so what is a typical founder profile uh, that you see i i think it is fascinating right so on the one hand like i said you you end up seeing you know two or three insurance executive almost like executive level people founding a company but then on the opposite end of the spectrum you also have you know pure technology teams that kind of start up you know they've probably been part of um, like a really fast growing um, consumer technology startup or like a mobility company or food delivery company and they've sort of seen the problems around getting insurance for a specific use case and these guys would end up sort of going and creating their own insurance startup i say there isn't really like a defined kind of profile and especially in india where i'd say that we're still at the early stage with about 25 i guess venture scale in short x it's very hard to kind of pull out a profile per se and you know even when you look at the liquidity events there is kind of no guarantee that you have to be an insurance executive to be successful in fact you know if you look at a cover wallet lemonade which were the two most big recent exits Uh-huh. uh the founders don't really have an insurance background with the exception of maybe a bit of uh, consulting work so I, i'd say you know come at this with a customer problem uh, sort of mindset and you know chances are insurance will be part of your overall solution uh, may not always have to be the core of your solution yeah yeah so all right let's uh, change the pace a little bit uh, let's do what we call a rapid fire round Sure. short and short and interesting answers to the following questions uh the best insurtech startup that nobody has heard of oh my um you should have a handful right <laughs> oh, this is this is a really tricky one right so one of them i think i mentioned about twice or thrice on the show is a, com- a company called metamorphoses and uh, they actually recently raised uh, pre series a from uh, good capital and a bunch of uh, funds i think these guys are you know typical kind of you know insurance uh, executive kind of profile uh, folks i think their kind of run rate is very very good and you know if you kind of look at their client base out in southeast asia absolutely incredible but you look at their social media presence or you know uh, i guess podcast or any form of uh, digital media presence absolutely none so if you're listening and you want like a better core system middleware kind of provider these guys are great i'd say they definitely wants to look out for okay uh who are the most interesting people to follow on insurtech maybe oh you could make that specific to india <laughs> um say so i'd say there's definitely the founder of um, toffy insurance so toffy insurance is a series a insurtech startup focused on 
what people call like Satchit Insurance or Rohan Kumar from Toffee is really good. There's also, uh, that's maybe on the founder side, I'd say on like an industry observer side, Amit Goyal from Medici is uh, fairly kind of in tune with what's going on and he's also invested in a few companies. So he has a really good perspective, both as, you know, observer and investor coming at it. So I'd say those are two people I'd follow. Okay. Uh, one thing insurtechs can learn from carriers? Uh, it, it, super tricky, right? Um, focus on retention, right? And the the reason for this is um, you may be familiar with the fact that insurance first year commissions can in some lines of business can be really high, right? That's you may end up paying, yeah. So effectively, spot on, right? Front loading commissions. And, you know, it's all fun and games when, you know, you're maybe raising every nine to uh, 15 months and, you know, you can show like explosive uh, top line revenue metrics, but insurance can be a very high churn industry, you know, something like 30 or 40% customers can drop out on the first kind of annual renewals. Yeah. So yeah. carriers put a lot of emphasis on retention. I think in recent years, they've gone from front loading commissions to, uh, putting a bit more emphasis on year two commission to kind of force renewals. So maybe learning a little bit there around uh, managing customer lifetime value better through improved retention might be something to learn from them. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, kind of interesting you mentioned that. Uh, uh, I think a few years back, I'm not, not very sure if it was three or four years back, uh, the IRDA changed uh, definitions of the persistency ratio, right? Which is, yes. you know, what percentage of your... Uh, uh, customers renew yeah. and uh, you know some of the some of the insurance companies uh, found out that 80 percent of the customers had churned right uh, so so yeah I mean that's uh, retention is one of those things that you absolutely have to have a handle on uh, one, one thing that carriers can learn from insurtechs oh, um, I'd say definitely kind of being open to um, different pieces or kind of being i guess a bit more open to different sort of ideas and the reason why i'd say this is the carriers because of you know previous uh, things such as the ulip uh, unit linked insurance policy mis selling have are fairly kind of conservative and they adopt a um, you know ask for permission rather than ask for forgiveness from the regulator approach and i'm not saying you know go ahead and you know uh, break the regulator's rules but you know insurance kind of opens a lot of scope for carriers to pretty much try out products so long as they can insure it and they have the balance sheet at their disposal that's it just be open to uh, trying out non-standard products you know like Tata AIG is looking at uh, trigger-based weather insurance so maybe looking a bit more in that kind of direction and having openness with new ideas maybe yeah, I think that's a that's in general. I think in general, any yeah. large company should learn that from uh, startups. Yeah. Uh, okay. Are actuaries any fun at parties? Um, not really, right? Because they <laughs> end up calculating like the, um, the the present value of uh, all of the money you have spent and yeah. how it will affect your retirement or something. So yeah, don't don't get an actuary at a party unless they've drunk like a couple of, uh, I guess at least a bottle before they've shown up. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, if you had to choose an Indian founder to work with? Oh, um, this is like really tricky one, right? But I'd say one of the founders that always kind of stood out to me is uh, Varun Dua from Echo Insurance. And I'd say one of the cool reasons why is, you know, you, men, you, you quoted Angela Strange that every company will become a fintech company. Effectively, I think Varun saw this back in 2015 and you know, came up with this idea that the insurance company should just be like an embedded layer. So if you have a second and you're listening to this, you know, if you go to Acco's website and then just have a look at their partnerships list, I think you'll end up scrolling for about 20 or 30 seconds just to get through all of the partners they work with. And these are all kind of startups, right? So it's pretty much an infrastructure company for insurance that has its own balance sheet. So definitely him, you know, he's been at it for quite a while, Cover Fox as well. I'd say he would be very, very cool to work with. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. Aqua has, uh, I mean, has been doing some interesting work. 
so seeing that you know we're three months plus uh, in this whole lockdown semi lockdown situation what is the best uh, quarantine hack that you've discovered oh um it I, i wouldn't say it's necessarily like a hack right but what i'd say is um, maybe make the most of the time you have and you know when i say this i don't mean you know start coding up your startup or you know find like some cool hobby but even if it means spending time with family like do that don't feel you know under compulsion seeing what people post on social media about you know how many lines of code they've written how many books they've yeah. written i think mm. a hack sometimes is also giving you a bit of a, i guess internal satisfaction or joy like spend time with family and enjoy it because uh, chances are you'll be back to a 45 minute uh, one way commuter day in less than a year yeah dude you sound way older than you are so <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you are in insurance yeah <laughs> so uh what books are you reading what book or books are you reading well that's a really nice one so the book i'm reading right now is actually kind of very apt for the stock market which is um, mastering the market cycle by howard marx he's a fund manager of oak tree capital which i think manages about 120 billion but i think it's it's a very fascinating kind of take about how uh, the markets have a bit of a self fulfilling prophecy so you know if everyone thinks the market is going to go up you know stock market momentum will take it up if people think think things are going to be bad they will go bad but i think very specifically in today's context why it's interesting is because you may have heard this people are shouting on twitter from the top of the hill that uh, lending is dead but he has this incredible quote in the book which says that the worst loans are made when the market is at its best and effectively what he says is um, you know the effectively lending might be reborn in every market even india as well because of stricter underwriting rules so if you maybe thought 16 17 was like lending boom maybe 2021 will be like the next lending boom as well i've only lately discovered the equity markets otherwise i mean <laughs> i was a very conservative person uh, I, i mean happy to be among the 4% in india <laughs> who invest in equities <laughs> as of uh, as of last month right uh, yeah uh, do you listen to podcasts at all if so i mean what are some podcasts you recommend obviously this one right yeah of course of <laughs> course i mean it, it it goes without saying startup yeah. operator everyone should be listening to it but you know apart from this one of i think there are two i really enjoy one of them is uh, you may have heard of 20 minute vc by harry stebbings yeah harry stebbings yeah yeah i think he's fantastic. got yeah fantastic guests on there the other one because uh, patrick is actually able to bring like every heavy hitter on the planet to his show is uh, investing like the best mm-hmm. and investing like the best has everyone from uh Ben Thompson to Shishir from uh, Coda and you know a couple of great people out there so i'd say those are the two i would personally recommend and which i'm listening to right now yeah yeah so i personally like the the knowledge project uh, uh yeah. with uh, Shane Parrish i mean he's got yeah. fantastic guests on, on there as well uh, i like uh, Nawal's podcast yes. uh, obviously right yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> uh yeah so all right i mean uh, so we're at the end of the podcast right and we usually end this on an optimistic note not that uh, it was anything but optimistic over the last <laughs> hour right uh, yeah. to end on an even more optimistic note uh, so what are you looking forward to in this post covid world you know specific specifically from an indian insurtech perspective yeah no i think it's uh, this is one of the question i was really looking forward to right so Mm-hmm. what i'd say is the indian msme segment really needs you and to be completely honest with you the the market timing is absolutely perfect right so in the past year the regulator has come out with a standardized health insurance product they're in the process of coming out with a standardized um, for lack of words uh, business insurance product effectively there's a very good chance that someone listening to this will go out and build an sme focused insurance startup to really get you excited right the numbers are 
42.5 million SMEs out there. I think they have about 106 million employees. Uh, insurance penetration there is pretty much very, very low. And, and even if you can hit, you know, a very basic product, 500 rupees per year as premium for health insurance, you're looking at a market size, which is just shy of about $700 million in top line. And if this doesn't get you excited, you know, you look at startups like Bharat Pay, Kata Book, Phone Pay, they're focusing on the MSME segment from a working capital and payment side. There is nothing that kind of stops someone coming in at a grassroots level on insurance as well, because it's the market size is so large. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that's a super positive note to end the podcast on. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Rahul, for helping us understand the InsurTech ecosystem. I think we're all smarter, more informed uh, for it. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. The podcast uh, will be available on Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Anchor, YouTube, and a bunch of other platforms. Uh, so if you like this episode, then don't forget to share and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe and take care.